Thank you for being here today. I know the family is blessed and honored that, that you would be here. And just uh, your attendance here today expresses um, the love and respect that you have for Paul and also the care that you have for Jan and Clark and Lexi and this family. And they really appreciate it. And um, at times like these, a lot of times, you know, folks are coming in from a lot of different places and driving and they're tired and, and grieving. And a lot of times, um, memorials can be a little bit awkward. And I want you to take a second and just exhale. Because today is a very, very special day as we honor Paul Costa. I want you to let your guard down and allow your heart to be at peace because we're celebrating a very special person today. The Holy Spirit is here. The Lord in spirit form is here today. And we had the opportunity to celebrate one of the most amazing people God ever put on earth. One of the most gifted. To me, he was really larger than life. But he was so real and he was so authentic. It's actually going to be impossible for me or any of us to honor him in a way that we would like in this limited amount of time. Because his life impact was so far reaching. Think about it. There are places that Paul ministered and went and, and groups of people that he knows and spoke into that, that none of us have ever seen, none of us have ever met around the world. And there's people who love him just like this group of people in many different spots around the globe. But we're going to try and do our best to honor him and to paint a picture of his life in a way that's a blessing to him and a blessing to this family. In this moment, we all get the opportunity to receive comfort and peace from God. So allow yourself to enjoy this moment. Allow yourself to be ministered to. I believe the healing starts today in this atmosphere filled with grace and peace. Let's welcome the Lord here. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be here together. Lord, when we're hurting, it's so important that we're together. And God, I pray that we would exhale, that we would stop, that we would relax for a moment. And allow, allow ourselves in this moment, God, to celebrate a life, to allow ourselves to be comforted, to allow ourselves to begin to heal, and to allow ourselves to experience the peace of God. We are open to you now, and we welcome you here today. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got um, three very special personal remembrances. One is from, our first one is from Denny Duran, who was a very important person in Paul's life and uh, played a significant role in Paul's coming to the Lord. And... Um, Clark kind of shared some, some of that story to give the context of where Paul was when Paul met Denny. And in a minute, we're going to have a, a video from Denny. He was not able to make it, but he's, he sent a video. But before that, we play that video, I want to give you the context of where Paul was at the time he met Denny. And again, this, um, Clark wrote this, so it's, it's very special. My brother, little Paul, passed away when he was four years old back in 1971 in Buffalo Children's Hospital when my dad played for the Buffalo Bills. 
while little Paul dying was an absolute horrific event, it became one of the most defining moments in my father's life, as well as the catalyst that propelled my fa father towards finding truth and peace in his life. Up until this point, my dad's life he was living was mainly for himself. He was the Lord of his own life and lived according to his own whims. When little Paul died, it caused my dad to question things. He literally said, if Paul is dead, he is in heaven, and I need to find a way to get there. Through the next several years of his life, my dad sought a way, and God brought people along his path to speak truth and destiny into his life. My dad gave his life to Jesus Christ shortly after meeting a young quarterback evangelist named Denny Duran in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, and his life was forever changed. And now things have come full circle, and my father is rejoicing with little Paul in heaven. The death of my little brother started a chain reaction through my father leading him to give his life to the Lord and eventually leading thousands of people in faith in Jesus Christ and healing. Genesis 50, 20 says, beautifully, you, the enemy of our soul, intended to harm us, but God intended it for good and to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Let's play uh, that video from Denny Duran. Hi, my name is Denny Duran, and I'm just so honored to have a part in this time of celebrating my dear brother, my big brother, Paul Costa. You know, the first time I met Paul was in Birmingham. We were both players in the World Football League. And of course, Paul was 10 years younger than I. And the first time I met him, he walked up this big, good-looking guy. I mean, to look at him, that's what a pro football player should look like. And he was one of those guys that transcended all of the changes of pro football. Still, to this day, he was the guy that looked like a pro football player. And I was pretty overwhelmed, honestly. In fact, pretty much intimidated. He drove up in his big gold Mercedes Benz that he'd driven off of the showroom floor. And he spoke with intellectual skill. He was, of course, a Notre Dame boy. And uh, he was a businessman, uh, owned the biggest bar in Birmingham, Alabama, along with his teammate, John Matlock, and several other businesses. And he shook my hand, and when he shook my hand, I, I said hello, but I honestly didn't have anything else to say to him. I was just so intimidated by this big guy. And I realized I was now playing football with somebody I'd had bubblegum cards of as a kid. And I uh, watched our relationship as it grew. It grew because I began to pray for him. I began to pray, oh God, I pray that you'll save Paul Costa. You know, I felt like if God could save Paul Costa, he could save anybody because Paul didn't, didn't seem interested in spiritual things whatsoever. I mean, I'd walk into the dressing room. I just made it a project and I'd see him across the dressing room. I'd say, Lord God, there he is, get him. I pray, Lord, that you will save him, that you'll do a work in his life. Well, he started coming to our chapel meetings that I held every game day for about a half hour. And he would sit on the back row and he would make faces at me and try to distract me. And uh, it, it was just that kind of relationship. So loving, so kind, always gracious to me. Felt like, I guess, I, I guess he felt like I was kind of a little brother as well, being younger and, and being so in awe of him. But something happened. He began to want to hang out with me more and more. And he kind of left his old friends behind. And we went to Hawaii on a trip. And we went all over the island of Hawaii. And he was taking pictures of me standing in front of churches. And he said, honestly, he said he thought he was losing his mind. He said, why in the world am I not? I mean, I'm in Hawaii. I should be out partying and doing what everybody else is doing. He said, but here I am with this rookie traveling around the island taking pictures. And he became more and more interested in the things of God. Even that day as we went around the island, really that week, we talked about the things of God. We had chapel one morning and, you know, he had made statements to me. Like he came up to me one time and he said, 
hey, Denny, I uh, went to church this morning and I got so excited. And I said, well, what happened, Paul? He said, five statues got up and walked out. I mean, that, that was the kind of thing that he was always saying to me. You know, hey, hey Denny, does, uh, does Jesus love me as much as my girlfriend loves me? And then he would kind of twinkle his eyes, you know, just, just doing his best to embarrass me or, or get me into a situation that was uncomfortable. And this particular day, he walked up after chapel and he said, Hey, Denny, I think I did what you talked about in chapel. Well, I was expecting the punchline, honestly. But he was very serious. And he said, I think I gave my life to God the way that you talked about. I said, You mean be born again? He said, Yes. He said, That's what I did. And sure enough, he had given his life to Jesus. Well, soon after that, he broke his leg. And so he was just sitting in his apartment recuperating. And I bought him a living Bible, and I put an inscription in the front of it, and I gave it to him. Well, he read that Bible through three times in the next six weeks of his recovery, and his life was elevated to a brand new place in Jesus. Well, after that, he came and was my first assistant coach at um, Evangel University. We had the greatest time there. I'll tell you, Jan and then little Clark was born. I mean, we, we just had the most precious time. Those years in Springfield were wonderful. All the boys fell in love with him. All of these, these linemen, they, they still to this day talk about them. In fact, I saw one of them in Florida last week talk about him being the greatest coach that they ever had. And I can tell you, I miss my big brother today. I love him so much. I can tell you that he's still with us in the form of Clark Costa. Clark's smile, his, his sense of humor, his brilliance, um, his infectious laugh and winsome personality, he is his dad. And Clark, I wanna tell you that you're gonna carry the legacy of your father on. And we are so blessed uh, by the Jesus that we see in you that was in your dad as well. And we wanna to say to you, Jan, how we love you. You're, you're just so beautiful and so lovely in every way. And we know that the memories that you and Paul had and the work of God that you forged together is going to last for eternity. I, I wish I was there with everyone to see all of you, but I just send my love and Deonza sends her love as well. And I uh, just want to tell you what a joy it is for me to be a part of of this moment to honor my big brother, my my dear friend and comrade in the gospel, Paul Costa. Love you, Paul. That was good. It's awesome. Now Clark wanted to share. Clark, come on up. Clark so absolutely loved his dad, but Paul absolutely was so proud of his son, and you can see why he is just such an incredible person and man and he has some really special things that he wants to talk about related to his dad love you clark love you too man Ooh. okay nobody start crying you made me cry <clears throat> Whew. It, it uh seems like not too long ago i was sitting at my own grandfather's funeral watching my dad speak and I remember sitting there as a kid watching my dad cry and thinking it's okay to cry in front of people so if I cry it's okay my dad said so <laughs> <laughs> uh, first and foremost I'm on behalf of my my father and my family I'd like to just thank everybody for coming today I know it means a lot to me I know it means a lot to my father it means a lot to my mother uh, the rest of our family uh, I'd like to thank Gateway, Pastor Byron. This guy right here is a real deal. Uh, he was, yeah, give him a round of applause, seriously. <laughs> Pastor Marie. Pastor Marie, right? Stand up, Pastor Marie. Stand up. They've been uh, amazing throughout this whole process, and I can't fathom if we had to do this by ourselves. Uh, God has been so gracious during this whole time. You know, and it's, it's interesting hearing Denny uh, speak. I've known him, of course, since I was born, and you know him, him speaking from that point of view as a friend or as a, as a teammate. You know, my dad was a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
You know, he was, of course, an all-star football player. You know, of course, he was a coach. How many people in here were coached by dad? Is there anybody here? There, look around. There you go. You know, he was a great coach, a great man, and, of course, he was a minister, ministered all around the world. He spoke all over the place, literally around the globe. You know, but his true heart and what I knew him as was a father. You know, he was a father. You know, and he was an amazing father. He was such a good dad, such an amazing father. You know, this past week, you know, during this, this tough time, I just, I kind of remembered this prophecy in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. It says, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and turn the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I'll come and strike the land with a curse. And right there, it shows the importance of a father. You know, how vital is a father? You know, you look around our country, look around the world, and there's just so much destruction. Well, why is that? Well, I think it's because there's a lack of, of fathers in the world. There's a lack of fathers in our communities. You know, there's a large void that only fathers can fill. Amen? Amen. You know, there's such a, a need for fathers, so much need for men to stand up and be fathers. And again, my father was one of the best. He was one of the best. You know, and that made me start thinking, like, well, what made dad such a good father? What made dad such an amazing father? It wasn't because he was a football player. It wasn't because he was a good coach. It wasn't even because he was a good minister. I'll tell you what made my dad a good father. The first thing that sticks out to me was his love. It was his love. He had so much love. He was always telling me he loved me. Can you imagine that big guy right there in that picture telling this big guy here, I love you. I love you. You know, and, and it wasn't just about saying it, it was about showing it. As a matter of fact, Rick, my best friend growing up, Rick was telling me the other day, he said, yeah, he said, I remember the first time going over your house, you know, we're 16 or 17, we're going out, and you know, we're the big guys around, you know, and well, he was the coolest guy, and I was the biggest, and uh, <laughs> we're leaving the house, and my dad, okay, you guys have fun, and, and uh, come here, son, and he, you know, I'd walk over, and he said, I love you, and he'd reach around, give me a hug, and he'd give me a kiss, and Rick was saying, man, it was so weird, so weird seeing your dad. You know, these two big guys, okay, I love you. Mwah. You know, I received a message yesterday uh, from an old college friend of mine. And uh, he wrote and he said, he remembers the first time meeting my dad on campus. This is 15, 16 years ago. And he said, you know, I saw your dad and, you know, of course he heard stories and all that. And he said, I saw your dad walk in. He said, I saw this amazingly large guy, this big guy, bigger than life. And you know, these big hands and big rings and, you know, championship rings and all this. He's like, man, that's just, he's, I, he never, I've never seen anybody that big and that powerful looking. You know, I've never met a professional athlete before. And he said, you know, he comes up to my dad and he sheepishly sticks out his hand. And he said, you know, hi, Mr. Costa. And he said, my dad grabbed his hand and pulled him in close for a hug. <laughs> and that's just what kind of guy he was. You know, as a matter of fact, the last thing my dad said to me a week or two weeks ago tomorrow the last thing my father said to me, he was in and out of consciousness in the ICU, and he said, I said, Dad, I love you. And he said, I love you. And then he had an oxygen mask on. He tried to reach, he tried to kiss me through the oxygen mask. And the second thing that made my dad such an awesome father was that he was a protector. He was a protector in the natural. In football, what did he do? He protected the quarterback. I guarantee you, Denny Drum was very thankful for that. He protected the quarterback. He protected the running back. All my dad's friends said, you know, I love going out with your dad because he always protect us. He'd always protect us, make sure nobody hurts us, make sure nobody, you know, of course, back then, that's before you saved and going to a lot of bars and those kind of things. And I could tell you a lot of stories not appropriate for church. <laughs> and I remember when I was a kid, I was probably in second, third grade at Park Avenue Elementary School. And I remember this so vividly. I had this, uh, this teacher a couple classrooms away from my classroom. And every time I walked by this teacher's classroom, this teacher would kick me, literally kick me on the butt. You know, he'd kick me. And I was like, you know, why is he kicking me? And I went home that night, and I said, Dad, you know, we're eating at dinner. I said, Dad, Mr. So-and-so, he kicked me. You know, my dad's eating. And, you know, remember, anybody remember dad's, you know, the head, how he did? <laughs> he did this, and he looks at me. And dad, all he said was, let me know if he does that again. That's all he said. You know, that was a man of few words, if you, if you really knew him. 
So the next day, you know, I go to school. I walk by the teacher's classroom again. This teacher kicks me. So I'm like, oh, no, why did he kick me again? I go home that night. I say, yeah, Dad, you know, dinner again. You know, Mr. So-and-so, he kicked me. And he said, he just, all he said was, okay. That's all he said. <laughs> next day I go to school. This is a true story. Next day I go to school. You know, I go to school for the day. Uh, uh, the school bell rings. I come out of school. My mom or my father would pick me up right in front of Park Avenue Elementary. I walk out there. I see my dad's car on the curb. So I walk up to the car. You know, my dad left the car open. You know, the door is open. He wasn't in there. I open up the door like he always, he never locked anything, never locked the door in the house, never locked the door in the car. So I sit down inside the car and I'm just sitting around. I'm in second, third grade. I'm looking around. And all of a sudden I see the administration doors on Park Avenue open. I see my dad walking out of the school with the teacher by the back of the neck. <laughs> And he walks up, and my dad had that look. He walks up, walks up the car, and I roll down, you know, old-fashioned, crank it down. And my dad looks at the teacher, and he says, now you apologize to my son. And of course, the teacher, I mean, I think he had to change his drawers later that night. <laughs> Scared to death. Of course, he apologized to me, but that's who my dad was. He was a protector. And a third thing, one more thing, I promise, I, I used to preach a lot, so excuse me, I'm going a little long. Third thing that made my dad such an amazing father was he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to sacrifice. I remember so vividly being a kid. Uh, one day, I was probably 10 or 12, and I was walking with my dad, and he just looked at me randomly out of the blue. And he said, son, I want you to know I would die for you or your mother. He said, I would die for you and your mother. And at the time, I was thinking, that's weird. Why, why would he say that? Of course, now, looking back, I understand what he's talking about. Yeah, I remember in Alabama, going through some financial difficulties, and, and my dad was in the ministry full time. And it was around the holidays, and my dad, I mean, he was an ex-pro football player. He was a PhD, graduated from Notre Dame. And what did he do to make ends meet? He went and got a job as a security officer so he could work at night. Remember that, Mom? And getting a job at service merchandise just so we wouldn't go without during the holiday season, during Christmas time. And I know, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that while he was laying there in the hospital, if you gave him a decision to keep on living or you can give up your life to have an impact on just one person's life, without a doubt, he would have willingly gave up his life. No doubt. Willingly gave up his life. You know, over the past couple weeks, received literally hundreds upon hundreds of testimonies and stories and funny stories and quips from text messages and Facebook and all the social media stuff and emails and, you know, they're amazing. I am so thankful. Guys, keep sending them. Keep sending them. It encourages me. I'm so thankful for those things. But one really, really stuck out to me. Reggie Brock, are you here by chance, Reggie? Reggie right there, Reggie. Hey, Reggie. Reggie wrote this. I asked him if I could share it, and he said yes. And this right here, this, this encompasses who my father was. This is, this is him in a nutshell right here. I'm going to read this to you guys. It says, I just learned this morning that my friend and college football coach, Paul Costa, breathed his last breath on earth. My heart is heavy this morning, not because he was an all-pro NFL football star, or even a superhero to me as a coach. Rather, my mind raced back to the first time we met in 1977. He and Jan were standing under a large tree at our practice facility, gazing at two dogs named Gus and Sadie, who were hanging on a rope far above the ground. Let me, let me interject right here. They weren't hanging by the neck. <laughs> they were hanging by a rope. They were pit bull dogs. If you know my parents, you know what, what pit bulls, right? Forever. They love pit bulls. And these dogs would grab this rope by the mouth, not by the neck, and swing on these ropes. And they'd just swing and swing. That's how they had fun. That's how they played. And he says, hang on a rope far above the ground. With nothing on their minds but just hanging on. Whew. He says, in 1977, I was still in a haze from a great disappointment, abandonment issues, unforgiveness, and just plain anger. Like Gus and Sadie, Paul Costa helped me just hang on. I don't remember life-changing words, an unforgettable moment, a lot of emotional fanfare, just a constant voice telling me 
I was going to be okay. Just keep hanging in there. Work hard. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and learn to block linebackers. He says, here is what I learned about life during my four years with coach. Sometimes all people need from you is for you to help them hang on. He wasn't my fixer. He was just my friend and walked the path with me. I am indebted for his life pouring into my humanity when I was close to tapping out. Thanks, coach. Rest in peace. You will never be forgotten. You see, that's what life's about. That's what life's about. That's what made him a good father. You know, life's about loving people. Life's about being there for people. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if my dad was standing here right now, he would tell all of you guys, hey, don't cry for me. What do you cry for me for? Don't cry for me. I'm in a much better, just like he told me when I was a kid. He told me that. He said, don't cry when I die. He said, know that I'll be in heaven. No, without a shadow of a doubt, I will be with my heavenly father. You know, and I believe what made my dad such a good father is the fact that he was a good son to his heavenly father. Amen? Amen. Thank you guys for listening to me. Love you guys so much. Pastor Brian, it's all yours, brother. Apostle John, come on up. He's going to share our last personal remembrance and and Paul associated with himself with all sorts of incredible people. And John Kelly is one of those folks that ministered around the world with Paul. And they were just very close friends. And so we're honored to have you speak today. Bless you, bro. It's just, it's wonderful to be here. Because one of the things that Paul ever said... He said, if and when I ever pass, never have one of them crying, sad sack funerals. He said, have a cel- he said I want a celebration. He said, I want them laughing. I, I, hello? And if you know Paul, you know that that's really his heart. And I, I want to thank, you know, Gateway Church for having us all here. And uh, it was just I was really touched by Pastor Brian Copeland. Uh, What a wonderful man of God that I have met just recently. Uh, His words to the family and to myself uh, have been just so, so healing, so strengthening. And Paul has been blessed to have such a outward, beautiful woman, Jan Costa, whose heart is even more beautiful than her outward beauty. And Clark has always been that strong, faithful son. And he and I have had a little history, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of your life, Clark. It's been an honor. What a tremendous family. I met Paul Costa when I was 16, and he was 17. And we were being recruited by a lot of the same schools And at that time, he was going to a prep school, and I was being recruited by that prep school. And when I walked into the coach's office, the coach had me meet Paul Costa. And I thought I was Mr. Everything until I saw Paul Costa, and I realized I didn't have much of anything going for me. (laughs) And and I'm supposed to be a defensive end and a middle linebacker going up against a guy that's actually bigger than me, and faster than me, and I thought, there's no way I'm going to make it at this school, praise God. And then we met a couple of other times in places like Chicago and Atlanta, changing plans, planes when we were being recruited to universities. And, and then many years later, uh, uh, you know, he, played, he went to Notre Dame, and, you know, Paul is one of the few guys that ever played football that came out that could actually write and speak English correct. You know, I never met a football player in my whole life that could actually even speak English. You know, we were very good at American slang. But Paul actually got an education. I was thrown out of the college at the end of my sophomore year because of assault and battery against my coach. And Paul used to call me wild thing. 
And, um, but uh, I can remember uh, I'd gone up with the New York Jets and I played three preseason games. And I was, I was actually traded to the Buffalo Bills. And I called Paul up on the phone and said, hey, I'm coming to camp. I'll be with you tomorrow. And he said, oh, man, that's wonderful. That's great. We'll have a lot of fun. And when I hung up, I, I, I realized something. He didn't know who I was. <laughs> you know, but that's just the kind of guy he was. And on the way up, I drove a car off a cliff and broke my collarbone and never made it. But, but he and I, I found out many years later that he was in the ministry, that he had pastored a church in New York, which I was never aware of, and that he had pastored a church in Birmingham, and that he was in a transition. And I gave him a phone call, and we met in a place called San Antonio. And we had, there was this minister's meeting there, and he became a part of what I was a part of. And we, he and I, from that point on, traveled to nations, many, many nations together, and I would be doing minister's conferences, and I was kind of like the preacher-teacher kind of guy. But Paul was the intellectual. He was the teacher. He was the guy that was very, he would exegete the word and, and teach them. And he, many, and he would come back, and they, they would have him, these individual churches would have him come and have him minister in Latin America, and in, especially in, in Europe as well, and other, in the Caribbean and other parts of the world. And Paul had this tremendous ministry. But I've always had this kind of thing that when I travel, you know, I, I, I usually like to be alone because that's my time to just be alone. But when I would travel with Paul and I'd walk in these meetings, these minister meetings, everyone thought that he was my bodyguard. <laughs> you know, and, you know, being kind of a big guy, you know, I was like, whoa. But, but, but they would see him as my bodyguard, my protector. And to be honest with you, he kind of was my protector and my bodyguard. And, but when they heard him speak and they heard him teach, they realized that he was not there as the bodyguard. Hello? He was there to bring them the word of God and to teach them something on, on either what, the, what an apostolic church is or how, or how to move in the prophetic. And he would also teach on healings and miracles and all of these things. And he, was, he had such a tremendous word ministry, and he was so blessed with it, and they all loved him. Well, one of the things that I do when I travel, I, I love to be alone in my room, you know, because you just got to get away. And, and I, but with Paul, I'd always be with him. Now, mainly because, you know, we'd always get two twin beds when we were in a hotel. And you see, Paul would help me go to sleep. Yes, he wouldn't sing or anything, but he had this thing called a CPAC. And, and it had to do with uh, sleep apnea, and he put this on. And I loved it because it sounded like the ocean, and it would put me to sleep. And so Paul was the only person, even for, for the last 30-some years, that I ever shared a hotel room with because he was a fabulous room partner. But on occasion, he got a little strange. I mean, if you can imagine this, I'm in my late 60s, and I'm with him in Mexico, and we're in this big conference, and, I'm, and, and, and it's like, you know, hey, Paul, you know, I'm just tired. He's tired. He, sa he says, yeah, I'm going to jump in bed. Let's just jump in bed. So he jumped in bed, and I jumped in bed. And anybody know what it is to have a bed short-sheeted? <laughs> Hello? I mean, that's something you do in college. You learn that your freshman year in college. But I'm 69 years old jumping into a short-sheeted bed. <laughs> Yeah. Another, another time, another time he and I, we, we, were, we, were down in, we were down in, I believe it was Guatemala, and he got up in the middle of the night and went to the bathroom, and I, I kind of heard him, you know, and I fell back asleep, and I was laying there, and then all of a sudden, it was like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And what it was, was I was kind of laying there like this, and he put shaving cream in my hand. So, <laughs> glory to God. <laughs> one of, one of, our, one of our, our great rewards was we walked in a restaurant a couple of years ago called Colvines up here in South Lake, Texas, and there was these two sandwiches on the menu, and one was called the Paul Costa, and the other one was called the John Kelly. And the Paul Costa 
was the meatball parmesan. And, and, the, and the, uh, John Kelly was the chicken parmesan, you know? And, I, and, and, and he said, hey, how come I'm the meatball parmesan? Because Paul never ordered meatball parmesan in that, play, in that restaurant. He always ordered chicken parmesan. And I was the one that always ordered meatball parmesan. But he said, how come? And I said, Paul, you're Italian. You're Italian. That's meatball parmesan. I'm Irish. I'm the chicken guy. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But Paul, is, Paul has been a, 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 a friend, a fellow minister, a confidant. Our birthdays are th three days apart, one year apart. Yes, I may not look it, but I'm, I'm the younger one. Hallelujah. I've had a lot of stress in my life, all right? But, but, but Paul has always been just a special one in my heart. Paul was a great man of physical strength, but to be honest with you, he was a greater man of spiritual strength. He was a man of strong faith and strong convictions. His yea was yea and his nay was nay. Yea, nay. You could always count on Paul. If you really didn't want to hear the answer, he was the wrong guy to ask the question to because he would tell you directly the answer. Paul was not only a man of great strength and great strength in the faith, but he was also a man of strong courage, incredible courage. And he, he would stand up many times. He and I would be in meetings in different parts of the world, and we were dealing with some very rough things and some very, very tough subjects. Definitely neither one of us are seeker-sensitive ministers. Hello? We are not the kind you would love to have for a pastor. But, but the thing is that both of us had this thing where we realized that we were called to disciple nations. And Paul was the kind that would speak very direct. And it's amazing how that caused many church leaders in those worlds to really stand up against the public policies of their, of, come on, of their politicians that were voting against the church and antichrist issues. And so Paul uh, was not only a man of great courage, but I was looking at this right here, and it says on this picture of, of Paul on the bottom, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hold it together here. For, it would help if I could see. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. Hallelujah. He was an apostolic teacher. He always called me an apostle, not an apostle. But I could say that Paul lived this, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Paul was not a man that was afraid of death. Paul understood the power of salvation, that Christians do not die, that only their flesh passes away, but their spirit passes on, and that they live a life of eternal rest, eternity, and that he was just going to another place but a flip, Philippians 1, I believe it's verse 23, Paul is talking about the fact that he's betwixt and between the call of heaven and the call of earth. And that when you're betwixt and between, what that really means in the Greek, it means that you're a man standing in the fullness of your strength with both arms out, stretched. And you're being, you're being pulled, you're being pressured by what's on your left and what's on your right the call of earth or the call of heaven. But the moment you lean, the moment you lean is the moment you go in that direction. I believe that Paul, just a couple of nights ago, he leaned. And when he leaned, he just got a, 
a look through the open portal of heaven. And once he saw that open portal, there was no turning back. There was no turning back because he realized to live is Christ and to die is gain and that we all shall live as Christ and recognize that to die is gain. Glory. Lynn Ellinghausen was Paul's favorite sister-in-law. Of course, she was also his only sister-in-law. <laughs> which made it easy to be his favorite. And she's also made All-American as a flight attendant. She's probably one of the, I think, one of the greatest flight attendants American Airlines ever had. Beautiful woman. But once again, like her sister, beautiful in the faith of God, with a beautiful heart. And she will come and sing Paul's absolutely favorite and most precious song. How great, come on, how great, how great thou art.
walk with me through fire you heal all my disease i trust in you i trust in Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hands. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible.
quit before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Still know his name 
there will only be one Paul Costa. And we were very and are very blessed to know him and to have known him. He left a legacy. And as I said before, he was larger than life. You know, I had the opportunity to know Paul before I had ever actually met him because I grew up in, in Denny's church and Denny was a, kind of a spiritual dad to me. And so he would tell us about Paul Costa stories. And so I knew him before I ever met him. And he was a giant to me. And um, he was a giant in many ways. He was a physical giant. He was a unique athlete. Size, speed, agility, athletic ability. Can you imagine Paul Costa as a punt returner? That's scary. <laughs> Folks would marvel at the size of his hands. Here's my hand. Here's Paul's hand. I would shake his hand. It was just, you couldn't see my hand. It was inside. <laughs> he was a legend in the NFL. In Buffalo Bills circles, they still talk about those championship teams and Paul Costa. And as been said before, he was a defender. Catherine shares a story about when she was a teenager and she went to the movies and the girls were all talking too loud and the usher pulls her out and takes her out of the movie theater, kicks her out. She goes home and Paul's like, why are you home? And she tells him the story and she said he just sat there real quietly, didn't really say anything. The next time they were at school, they walk in. She walks in the cafeteria and Paul's got this usher, this kid, <laughs> up against the wall. My sister's a lady and you better treat her that way. A greater story that even happened in our neighborhood here, North Richland Hills, just down the street at their home. It's a group of teenage kids who were hanging out in the neighborhood across the street. They drive by and they moon Jan. Big mistake. <laughs> Let me just tell them, big mistake. So Paul walks over and, you know, is, is demanding an explanation and an apology to his lovely, beautiful wife as she is. And these kids get smart aleck with him, all three of them. And so Paul, you know, Clark tells his story, but Paul's just so smart. He's so big and strong, but he's so smart. And nobody's going to mess with his wife. And so he's like, they're like, come on, old man. Let's see what you got. And these kids just start talking. He's like, yo, come on. And he backs himself off their property. They don't even know what he's doing. And he backs himself right out into the public street. <laughs> and one of the kids had a tire iron. And before it was over, they had got one swing at him and hit him which he didn't even feel it. <laughs> and all three of those kids were laying on the pavement in the middle of the street. <laughs> he was just a physical giant. But there were better parts of him. He was a relational giant. Jan describes Paul as faithful and trustworthy how he never wavered in times of adversity. She loved his crazy sense of humor and how he loved to tease. And I asked Jan, you know, to, what can you say about Paul? And she, her words were, he was just so alive. He was so full of life. And his favorite verse was 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Here's what it says. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, the new life has begun. I was talking to Denny when he was over um, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me about when Paul met the Lord. And he said, Byron, this, Paul was an amazing guy. He was an entrepreneur, and he had businesses. He just... You saw, I saw a picture of Jan leaning against that gold Mercedes, you know. I mean, just, he just had all kind of stuff going on. 
owned, owned multiple bars and businesses. And, when, and Denny said, Byron, when he got saved, when he gave his heart to the Lord, it was like, it was over. And Denny asked him, he goes, why, why are you getting rid of all your stuff? Why are you? He goes, it doesn't matter anymore. And it reminds me of, it reminds me of what my life used to be like. And he got rid of it all. And if you knew him, you know, you would know how simple of a man he was. He was powerful. He was very anointed and strong. And he was on a mission. But he was a very simple man. He was not materialistic at all. Clark can remember, he was telling me stories. He goes, Byron, I would see him when I was a kid. And I have these vivid memories of him. In the middle of the night, I could see, you know, through the door. And there's my dad on his knees, on his face, early in the morning or in the middle of the night praying. That's the kind of man he was. Such an incredible father and loving. Clark tells a story about his, he and his friend Patrick Gordon. They were playing around his car and, and uh, his friend accidentally ran into the car and busted one of the front lights and he was just petrified. So scared that, you know, to tell Mr. Costa. And so they walk in and they're, they sheepishly kind of walk in and they tell him what, what's happening. And, and, um, and Paul looks at Patrick, he goes, come here. And he brings him over and he sits him in his lap. And he picks him up and he gives him a hug. And he says, it's okay, buddy, it's okay, and gives him a big hug. No big deal. He was just a loving man. You know, um, a couple of years ago, my son tore his ACL in a football game. And, um, you know, it's, as a minister, you know, ministers are busy. They spend, have a lot of time, a lot of, they spend a lot of time ministering to others. And, and so, for a minister like Paul to give someone a lot of time was a very precious thing. Well, I called Paul and said, would you pray for JB? And folks, I'm not lying. He prayed for my son's knee. We went over there twice, went to their home for probably three hours. He prayed for my son. Just, it was just amazing, the love Probably a month ago, I went and visited him, and it was just a very unique visit, and he's always so full of life, and he was upstairs in the bed, and he had lost some weight, and he wasn't his big, strong self, but man, he was so full of life, and I, I walked in the bedroom and jumped up in the bed with him, and boy, we had a great time just talking, and he's just, he's speaking into my life I'm there to see him and he's encouraging me and the thing about that in, uh, that situation that was so important is that not that I jumped up in the bed with him and was laying there talking with him but that I felt comfortable to do that that's the kind of guy he was he was so relational and loving I'm going to miss him he used to sit right there, probably about nine rows back, right on the corner, right there. And the crazy thing about it is, guys, we have about 4,000 people, four or 5,000 people that attend this campus. And he's so unassuming. Now, he's huge, so he's not unassuming. The people in this congregation did not know, most of them, the impact of his life. He never bragged on himself. He never talked about it. He came to church here just like anybody else. He and Jan would sit right over there together. He would sit, and he would also sit in that chair right outside the door there. He'd sit there until service started. When he heard the music, he would come in. Most of the people here did not even realize that he traveled all over the world praying for the sick and ministering, loving people all over the world. 
And that in many parts of the world, he was just a spiritual hero. I love that about him. He was a spiritual giant. He really was. He was a physical giant. He was a relational giant. He's a spiritual giant. Clark remembers his dad coming to hear him preach in New York when he was pastoring up there. And this is just the kind of guy Paul was. He came to hear um, Clark speak. And then they all went to the restaurant. He's in the restaurant, and he's ministering to all the waiters and waitresses. <laughs> he's praying for them, and here the Lord told me to tell you this. And just, he didn't care. <laughs> it's really awesome. He was not the typical minister. He was one of a kind. I love it. That's why I loved being around him. He was not afraid. Clark gave me this little paragraph about his dad. One, one of the things I always heard dad say, whenever anyone asks me, what qualifies you to be in ministry? I tell them, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And who is more foolish and low than me? Those were Paul's words. And really, he was famous. In our world, he was famous. Such a humble man. Paul told me last year or so that God was, had really redirected his ministry. You know, for years he would go to churches all over the world and pray for the sick. People would bring the sick and he would pray. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. A man going around the world to pray for broken-hearted sick people. That is amazing in itself. That a man would give his life for that. But he told me, he goes, Byron, God's just redirected me. And he goes, now uh, God has called me to impart healing around the world. And so he would go into churches. It would look like this. He would come to a church and he would pray for the congregation. He, he would pray, I want to impart a gift that the Lord has given me. I want to pray and I want to give this gift to you so that you can go and pray for the hurting and broken, and broken people in your community. And how he would teach about healing and how that Jesus still heals, still heals and that miracles still happen around the world. There's a lot of people in this room who God's touched. That's why you're here today. Because the Lord showed up in a very unique way. Paul was so generous. We can all learn so much about Jesus thinking about who Paul was. How he lived. What he said how he treated others, where he went, what he did, his commitment to things that really matter. And in the Bible, um, after verses, they'll put the word selah, S-E-A-L-H. And that word means stop, pause, and think about it. I want you to close your eyes just for a minute. And I want, to th I want you to think about, just for a moment, a visual that you have of Paul, who he was, what he did, what he said, how he lived. Stop, pause, and think about it. Because we can see Jesus in Paul's life. Lord, thank you for those memories and those visuals that you're giving us, Lord, right now. Folks, there are things that are part of humanity that personally I wish would go away permanently. Pain, sickness, tragedy, death are just some of them, but they're the big ones. And 1 Corinthians 15 describes death and, and loss and the feelings associated 
with losing someone as a sting, the sting of death. I think it's the most painful sting when we lose someone we love and it knocks the wind out of us just for a moment sometimes. Jan, Clark, Lexi, and family, our hearts are hurting for you. We wish we could make the situation better and we wish we could make the pain go away. We really do. But none of us can do that. Folks, we now get the opportunity to minister to this family. And what I've discovered is that the only kind of heart that can minister to a heart that's dealing with loss is a humble and kind heart. When we're hardened, when we're bitter, when we're angry, we can't minister. We can't do it. It's not possible. Only a humble and gentle heart can minister to a heart that's broken. And all of us have questions. We do. But your heart is very important to God. My heart is very important to God. Keep your heart tender and kind as we move ahead. And I want to encourage everyone here, especially the family, to grieve and make sure you grieve well. The most unhealthy people are the ones who will not allow themselves to be weak on occasion. It's okay to be weak. It's so okay to be weak. God can be strong. We can be weak. Allow yourself to grieve. Allow your soul time to heal by talking and writing, encouraging one another, weeping, laughing at memories, hugging, maybe expressing anger and honest disappointment to God, humbling ourselves, worshiping, and in time your heart will heal. Listen, God designed us to heal. He did. And there are just things we do not understand. But we can, as Proverbs 3, 5, 6, trust in the Lord with all our heart. Do not depend on our own earthly understanding. There's just things that we don't know. We don't know the answer to everything. We don't know how everything works. Seek his will in all we do and he will show us the path to take. As I was praying for you guys, um, Jan and, and Clark, and Lexi, and just you, your, your family, God gave me a very special scripture in Psalm 136. And um, to get the context of it, King David is talking and he's talking about, he's, he's in a struggle, but he's, he's telling himself how good God is. And he's having to remember, he's going back and he's remembering the Israelites in Egypt. And he's, he's, he's talking about different events that happened. And every time he says an event, he says, your faithful love endures forever. Lord, remember when we were captives in Egypt, your faithful love endures forever. Lord, when we were here and here, and he's telling himself, he's building his faith. Your faith his faithful love endures forever. And so he's thinking about the past. He's having a time with God. And then he's moving into the future. His faithful love endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. I want to tell you, his faithful love is going to endure forever. And there's one part where David, King David, in Psalm 136, 23, and this is what he says, he remembered us in our weakness. His faithful love endures forever. God's going to be there for you. We made some special things for you. We want to give them to you. Rochelle, can you bring, can you come on and give these? Because I want you to remember his faithful love endures forever. Jan, his faithful love endures forever. Clark and Lexi, his faithful love endures forever. When you look at these, I want you to remember all the amazing memories and things that you have and remember it's not over his faithful love is going to walk with you every step of the way his faithful love endures forever and right in the middle of those five words is love 
And Jesus describes his love as living water. And there's going to be times in this journey of endurance that you're going to be tired and you're going to be parched and you're going to be weary. And here's what Jesus says to you and to the rest of the family and those who need him today. Anyone who drinks this water, and he's talking about a water in a well, will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never, ever be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them life eternal God is going to be there for you Jan, Clark and Lexi and family when life gets hard you experience sadness or grief or you lose your way remember that the Father's love will overcome you and he will comfort you A number of us were in the room when, when Paul passed away and he breathed his last breath and he went to be with the Lord. I was humble and honored to be in that room. It was very surreal for all of us, but I know this family the most because he was always so alive. And it, it's kind of like time stopped for a second and after tears and after a lot of tears a kind of a peace settled over that room and everyone just knew that he was not in that body and I remember you um, Clark just saying something like he's, he's, not, <laughs> he's not there anymore that's not my dad a new reality came he is with God and he is with the one who became his savior at the prime of his life. He was transformed. And here's why that's very important. Paul Costa finished his race not as a weak man, but, at what, but as a man full of faith. If you could have seen him just days before, really, he kind of lost consciousness. He was so full of faith and life. He finished his race full of faith. And listen, he finished his race clean before God. He was clean in his heart. Here's my question to you. Do you have faith today? And the second question is, do you, are you clean before God? The reason Paul Costa was the person he was was because of the Lord. And all of you knew him in this room and what he would want to know is, are you right with God? Is your heart right? Because the rest of this world won't matter if you're not clean before God. Paul's salvation was not just Paul's deal. It wasn't. Jesus came that was so that we could have a life and have it more abundantly. What does your heart look like today? We honor Paul today as a man who found and knew God personally through salvation in Jesus. Today is our opportunity to receive forgiveness, salvation, and intimacy with God. Let's bow our heads. As we honor Paul and the man he is and is to us and was in this world. Let's look deep inside of ourselves. Look deep inside and just ask yourself the question, where am I at with the Lord? Where am I with him right now? Am I clean before the Lord? Do I know him? Am I filled with anger and bitterness and cynicism? Is life destroying my soul? Or is God regenerating me today? And this is a moment between you and the Lord. A very special moment. Your heavenly father and us.
And I want to lead you in a prayer. And you can say it loudly or you can say it privately. But listen, today, if your heart is not right with the Lord, make it right today. Don't leave this building today not knowing that your soul is well with your soul. And I'll lead you, and again, you can pray it privately or you can pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. And though I haven't loved you back, I need you today. My heart is not clean. I need salvation today. And I ask you, Jesus, to cleanse me by your precious blood. I believe that you love me and I believe that you died to save me. And I welcome you in my heart today. And just as Paul lived for you, I want to walk with you and know you. Begin to change the direction of my life. But most of all, soften and melt my heart today. I want to walk with you. And one day I want to see you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a special closing song from Paul's sister, Catherine. Catherine, would you come on up? She has a, such a beautiful voice, and Catherine is going to sing the Lord's Prayer today as we close.
in a moment after I pray, the family will leave, and I want to have you have us all uh, wait here until the family leaves the auditorium, and then we'll meet them in the back in the chat room for a reception, and everyone is welcome to come. But again, uh, we'll allow the family to leave first before we join them back there. And a couple more things. Um, Paul's last years of ministry, again, I said God had kind of redirected him to pray for spiritual impartation of healing. And so um, before we leave today, I just feel appropriate that um, for those who would feel comfortable and would say, Lord, I want to be a part of doing the work of the Lord and praying for people who are sick and seeing you do miraculous things. Um, I, want, I want that impartation that Paul had, that gift and that calling. So I want to pray over you right now. Just everyone bow their heads. And if you feel comfortable, you can turn your hands up and pray as you pray. Lord, thank you for the work of Paul Costa. And Lord, all the the hurting people that he ministered to in his life. Lord, we'll never know all the names and all the faces of those who he ministered to. And Lord, we thank you for his legacy and we thank you that in the last years he has been praying for impartation of healing. And Lord, I pray that same impartation today that you gave to him by your spirit in this place, that we, Lord, would be aware and conscious of those around us who are hurting and that Lord you would give us the boldness to pray for them and to believe that you may touch them and bring, bring your miraculous power to those around us in need Lord we receive your impartation and that impartation that Paul prayed for many around the world we receive today I pray that you would let us see miracles and in, in lives who are transformed by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And on the way out today, kind of the culmination of Paul's work was his recent book. And you may or may, may not know that he recently published a book, but we want to give everyone a copy today. And so on your way out, you'll see a stack of books there. Make sure you, you grab one for yourself. We'd like for everyone to have... Uh, that book and we'd like for you to, to read it and take it in and really um, really see Paul's heart but if there's someone here that was not able to make it or someone who had to leave that you feel like would want one of those books also make sure you grab a copy for them also let's close in prayer Lord thank you for this opportunity Lord to be in your presence with family and friends and to honor Paul Costa Lord, thank you that you're taking good care of him right now. And Lord, we pray for your comfort and peace in the days to come, specifically for Jan, for Clark and Lexi, and this entire family. And we know many good things are ahead for them and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and you're dismissed.